My first question for you is, what do you think are the three keys to success? Just imagine that we had a time machine and we could go back in time yeah. 10 years ago and you could talk to little Joel Brown. <laughs> what would you tell him? Like, what are the three keys that would really move the needle? Yeah, it's such a great question. And I think what really became apparent to me recently was that no matter how much I chase the external things, I was never going to fully feel fulfilled until I tapped in to what's in here, right? I was always going for the outside and not working from the inside out. I was going outside to try and fill the in. And uh, when I was younger, I was very much material driven. Money was my motivation. Uh, I would compare myself to others. I would be in competition instead of collaboration. And it slowed me down in my walk to success. And you know, even that word success, like I don't feel like we're ever fully there and that's okay. I like that, I like the pursuit, I like the journey, and I like creating things. I value that a lot. So the first thing is really understanding that it's about work, doing the inner work here. And this is like, you take you everywhere you go. You are where your feet stand, right? And you get to choose every day where you live emotionally. And so I would just say when I, you know, the younger version of me to just chill out a little bit more, like still have that like focus and the drive, but chill out in the sense of, uh, knowing that there's so much that you can achieve within yourself without having to go for the external all the time. You know, the answers are here. And uh, the second thing I'd say, the second key would be that a vision is going to remind you and keep you aligned to remember why you're doing what you do. And it keeps you focused and excited on what it is that you desire to create. Yep. The how, how to do it shows up as you commit. and. I remember I was at the Think and Grow Rich movie premiere with uh, Bob Proctor, who was in The Secret. And he's in the Think and Grow Rich movie with, it, with me as well. And uh, he said to me, you know, Joel, the thing is I never fully 100% believed something before I started it. He said, I, at most I may 50% believe it, but I work out how to believe uh, along the way as I start showing to myself in reality that I'm committed to my craft. And that's what I would tell my younger version of myself is just really step in, like step up more, treat life like an experiment. You're always testing. Uh, when it comes to business, there's a risk and there's a risk for a reason. It's worth a lot. You know, when you get a business up and running and it's a, something that's impacting, it's fulfilling, uh, you're proud of it. That, that's a great reward that you get to have. And also just to know that you've turned this dream and this idea into reality. For me, that's like the biggest and greatest and most valuable thing is starting from here and going, I've got this idea and actually seeing it come to life and manifest it in reality is just, wow, like it's so cool that we get to create, right? Uh, and then the third thing, I would say that uh, it's important to live a multi-dimensional life. I think a lot of people focus heavily in one area or two areas in their life, and there's eight areas of life. There's business and career, there's finances, there's uh, health, there's self-development, there's fun and adventure, there's family and friends. And then the last one, uh, actually second last one is physical environment. And the other one is romance, right? And I think that a lot of people get stuck on this thing of working way too much, especially entrepreneurs where they sacrifice the relationships with their, their partners and, and their family too at that. So I would just say like being, you know, at the age of 32 years old now, I don't have a family. And uh, when it comes to romantic partners, I learn so much from romantic partners. They're the perfect mirror that shows and reflects back to me the areas that I need to grow in, that I get to grow in, uh, because I get triggered or because I, I, um, I, I'm encouraged to step up because I haven't achieved that level of communication or relationship yet. And I would just say, like, make that an important thing. Make that valuable to live a multi-dimensional life instead of just, just focusing on the business or just on the finances. Uh, create harmony in your life where you can set yourself up to win by having a vision where everything is touching everything and feeding into each other in order for you to be able to really optimize and elevate your life to a whole new level. That's you know, awesome. It's totally possible. That's awesome. Yeah. So the first key was to really follow what's inside you and not something that is external. Yeah. Um, how do you find what's inside you? Like, how, how do you know that you are doing the right thing? When it feels aligned to your highest values, right? Our values 
are essentially what we spend most of our time on, most of our money on, what we love talking to other people about, uh, what we read books about, look in your, your YouTube history and see what is the type of content you're consuming. These are the things you value most and you value it because there's like a void you're feeling. It's like this excitement you have around it or maybe it's an area that you wanna grow in in your life because you know that there's uh, potential that you have there and you desire to step more into it. And I would say the more you're aligned with your values, the more you're inspired from within. And my mentor, Dr. John Martini, says uh, the word inspiration means in spirit. That's where the word comes from. And I know when I'm in alignment with my spirit and my soul and, and I have that, you know, that clarity and that focus and also I'm able to hold myself accountable because I know that I'm fired up from within, from a genuine place. I'm not forcing it and looking for motivation, which is external drivers. I'm looking for inspiration and it starts here. And we live in a very distracted world where we don't check in and really just give ourselves some time out and drop into a space where we meditate or visualize or you know, have affirmations or gratitude or prayer or whatever it may be for you in your spiritual practice. I meet a lot of billionaires and multimillionaires that, you know, there's some of them even ask me like, Joel, what is it that you're like, why, you know, you're so positive or you seem like you're, you know, you're living this incredible life of travel and freedom and you've got great people around you. And I said, it's because I'm not spiritually bankrupt. You know, some of these people can be very spiritually bankrupt. So I would say that that's what it is, is uh, really getting to that place of self-awareness. You know, getting to know yourself, spending time by yourself. Some people are scared to do that. Yeah. They distract themselves all the time with their phone. They go and drink alcohol or they, they fill their day with sex or uh, you know, just going on dating multiple people. I've been there, I've done that before myself. You know? And it's just a distraction, avoiding the thing that you know needs to be faced. And uh, yeah, we live in a society where we're encouraged to avoid and it's kind of like, Oh yeah, well, if you're feeling like this, just go and have that, you yeah. know, like medicate yourself with these things rather than sitting down with it and going, okay, what's here? Yeah. You know, so that's a really important thing for sure. So you think that what's inside of you is like your drive, your motivation, um, the internal stuff. But you said like when you were younger, you had more for the external stuff. So how can I balance that? Just imagine that I'm an entrepreneur, I'm watching this video, yeah. like, should I go with how I feel or should I purchase, uh, or should, or should I go for money, for the lifestyle? Like, I'm a little bit lost. Like, could you just explain how, how could I balance that? Do I need to balance? Yeah, I'd take a pretty pragmatic approach in the sense that like, you know, I question things and, and, and the question is like, is this useful or not, right? If it starts impeding on my health, if it starts affecting my relationships, it's probably not the right thing for me. You know, sometimes some things can feel good but it doesn't mean it's the right thing for you. Yeah. You know, it can be misleading. That's what it says, like, even in the Bible, I remember reading it, it says, like, the heart can be misleading, and it's true. And then you sometimes have people that are like, you've got to follow your heart all the time. It's like, no, no, no. It's about bridging the mind with the heart, right? And there's, there's the answers there of, like, if we can make a logical and emotional understanding of what's really going on here, then we can really align ourselves with more power to make better decisions. I remember I interviewed Tony Robbins. You know, the way you're interviewing me, I had the opportunity to, you know, hang out with Tony on set of uh, the movie we're doing together called We Rise Up. And um, I remember this conversation we had around, like, how do you live a better quality life? And he said, the quality of your life is determined by the decisions that you make. And the truth is, when you're a baby, you haven't made any decisions yet, right? When you're little, you just come into the world, you're not, uh, you know, influenced or uh, infected with yeah. <laughs> limiting beliefs by, by your authorities, uh, you have like a fresh slate. And really to increase your belief, you need to increase your reference points in your mind. And I like to look at it as if uh, to have a great quality of life means that we have to make more consistently uh, better decisions, then the only way I'm gonna know if something's a better decision is if I go out and get mentorship, people that have walked the path before, uh, if I do the research uh, and if I live it, you know, it's all good having the knowledge and having the understanding where I can teach people these things. But if I don't have the wisdom, then I'm not fully embodying that thing. And I don't really truly know what it is. When, once you get the wisdom, when it's knowledge and understanding applied, that you can't just, it's not just you teaching it, but also actually living it. No one can take that away from you. That's where your power is. And that's how we make better decisions by having the experience, but also knowing that we're making the investment of learning and studying to un seeking to understand things before we step in. Awesome.
Yeah. Uh, the second key you said was about having a vision. How did you come up with a vision of Addicted to Success? Yeah. How, great question. How, how did it start? Uh, yeah, so that's, that's a great question. So 10 years ago, I was sitting in the room with Jordan Belfort at the Wolf of Wall Street, right? Not Leonardo DiCaprio, but the original <laughs> Wolf of Wall Street. And this was the first time ever that I had been challenged with this idea of casting a vision for the future, right? Really thinking about my dreams, my goals, my desires, how my life would look if I was living as the ultimate version of me five or 10 years from now. And at the time I had a little bit of resistance as most people do when I teach the vision process with them. And I did because there's this limiting story of am I worthy of this 10 year vision? So many people struggle with this yeah. because they don't feel like they're good enough. You know? And if you don't have the skill sets yet, if you haven't practiced being in alignment or sticking to your values, if you haven't uh, studied the industry that you may have an interest in, uh, if you don't have mentors, right? if you haven't committed to the habits, you haven't hired people with the skill set, then you're gonna be questioning yourself quite a bit. <clears throat> this is uh, natural. So what I would say is, it's not about perfect, it's about progress. And I casted this vision with the idea that if I write down the things that I'm most excited about, this is already getting me years ahead because before that I had no plan, you know? So I realized if I could wake up every morning with intention, going, okay, this is what I know my goals are. This isn't what I know I should focus my mind on more often. This is what I know now I should research. These are the type of people I should surround myself with. These are the things that are distracting me I need to start cutting out. These are the things I can do to optimize my body so I have more energy to create and to show up. And the more that I did that, the more I started to see the fruits of my labor come into fruition, the more I started to see the dreams that I have manifest in reality. And I just started believing even more and more in myself because I was practicing being a man of my word. When I wrote those things down in my 10 year vision, and I wrote it down as if I was already living in that 10th year and rehearsing it in my mind, because your theater uh, up here that's in your mind, that's where all the achievement begins. Up here, it's an idea, and then you get to action it. You know? And then when you action it, it then shows you as you more and more commit to this action and the more you start to like place bets on yourself, the more you start to get excited about creating something even bigger scale. And that's what happened for me. And that's when I casted Addicted to Success Vision to create the number one motivation website. At the time I wrote down I was gonna achieve 10 million views in 10 years. Yeah. You know, we're at the 10 year mark now, almost a 10 year mark. We reached 256 million uh -huh. website that's views amazing. alone, right? That's and I say that because it's not about like, hey, this is the numbers to impress you. I say that because it shows that uh, we 25 times the vision, and I say we because I started building a team around it, I couldn't just do it by myself, but we reached 25 times that goal within the vision. And I achieved everything in my 10 year vision within six years. And my students that I teach this vision process to now, all around the world, they're achieving their third and fourth year vision within the first year on average. So it just shows you what happens when you live your life with intention. Yeah. It's insane. It's incredible. Yeah. So <coughs> when people are trying to set a vision for themselves, what can happen is that they try to aim low because they say, oh, I'm going to aim low and then if I succeed, it's okay because it's a small win. They don't want to go for what they really want because they can fail. And I'm sure that many people who are watching that and it happened to me also, like, we don't want to go for that, that thing that we truly want because we are afraid of failure, of looking bad, of all that thing. So how were you able to write that vision of, oh my God, I'm going to have the website addicted to success that will have 10 million, 10 million views in 10 years. How are you able just to open up the creativity and gave yourself permission to be your best? Yeah, uh, there were a few things, a few factors that were brought into account. When I wrote out my vision, even though I was feeling the resistance, I kept writing, right? I kept forging through it. I then relaxed into the idea of what it could be if I, if I actually committed to the vision. And then through rehearsing it in my mind over and over again, 
my body started to believe it, you know, because your body is the unconscious and the unconscious is the body. The unconscious mind is the habit mind. And consciously I was choosing these desires and dreams, but then I was forging it by hammering into the habitual mind, hey, this is what we're creating, this is what we're creating, this is what we're creating, to the point where it came on board with my conscious, my unconscious came on board with my conscious, and we started working together as a team to be able to create what I've created. That's essentially how it works, like in a nutshell, yeah. without being too neuroscience-y and everything else. And sure, I have my fear of rejection, I have like, what if I make a mistake? What if I fail? Am I good enough? The reason why a lot of people don't place big enough bets on themselves is because they, they don't believe they're good enough. If you believe you were really freaking great at something, you would go in and you would, you would show up, right? And the practice in life, and this isn't just even in business, this is just every area of life. It could be approaching somebody that you are attracted to. It could be stepping up as a parent, going, I'm ready to be a great mother or father. Or it could even be writing a book, you know? When you keep practicing, showing up, no matter what, that's when you increase your belief. And did you feel amazing when you were writing that, that vision? Oh yeah, for sure. I, saw, I mean, I, I, got, I got excited. I got excited, but as I committed more to the vision and saw it unfolding in reality as truth, I got even more excited and like jazzed crazy. up. Yeah, yeah, I got, I got all in. You know, I was like, okay, if I've created this in this short amount of time, and the truth is you're gonna create a lot of stuff very quickly because you're holding back, doing nothing yeah. before. So when you start actually doing something, you, you start to see results. Right. I'm not saying everything comes in straight away. Some things take time, but some things, when you start mapping out the vision in the eight areas of life, you realize like, wow, okay, like these things are actually closer than I thought they were, you know? And that's what I was saying, like it increases your belief because you start to realize that everything that you actually want isn't really as far as you think it is, mm -hmm. that it's closer without living in a fantasy, right? Because you don't want to live in a fantasy all the time where you're, it's too, uh, too out of this world to the point where you're like fooling yourself as to what it is. You need realism at the same time. Stretch yourself, stretch your mind a little bit. You know, go and look for examples of people that have been able to crush it at a high level. Mm -hmm. Study them. If that person's been able to do it, you can do it too. Awesome. Yeah. And key number three was about uh, handling all the areas of your life, not forget one. Because as you said before, when you're an entrepreneur, you tend to forget, for example, the health or other stuff. Uh, do you think that like, you should go hardcore into entrepreneurship and just take a little bit care of your health? Or like, how do you deal with all the parts of your life? Because like, you're, you're a busy entrepreneur, successful entrepreneur, how do you deal with everything? Yeah, this goes back to the inside out, not the outside in, again, you know, and I think if we think that the business will give us everything that we've ever wanted, we'll find very quickly that it was the other things that were holding us up all along. Like the reason why you make your money could be very different as to why I make my money. You know, I think a lot of people don't clearly define why they make their income. You know, there's many reasons to make money. You, you can look at it like this as, um, you know, we're gonna talk about it as well in depth tomorrow at the Master Your Money Mindset event, is that you may make money because you value freedom. It could be contribution, luxury, uh, travel, significance, power, uh, resources, right? Like what, what is it? What would you need it for? Security, some people want it for security. If they had enough to just keep their place secure and, and they know that they're safe, that could be their highest need and that's it. They might not want the freedom of going out and traveling around the world or running the autonomous business that takes a while to set up, right? So you need to really <clears throat> define it for you. What would it be? You know, what, what, why do you make your money? I know for me, a big thing for me is to be able to have power, but not in, a, not in an evil or negative sense, power as in the power to choose more often, which is ultimately a form of freedom the power also to influence in a positive way, the power to also be able to connect others, the power to be able to turn whatever idea I have in my mind into a creation in reality. You know, so that's one of them. And another one is the freedom, the freedom to be able to, to travel, you know, to explore and experience different cultures and different people. 
like I love coming to new countries. We're in South Africa right now. Yeah, you know, same. first time here, and it's like wow. Like let, I want to know more about the people. I want to know how this place operates. You know, it's different. I'm already picking up on the differences between there and Australia, or there and Bali, Indonesia, where I live, and I, I just love that. And I think you really need to define it for yourself. Why do you make money? Because a lot of people they just keep running with the business, or they keep running with their money, or they keep running in. Uh, you know, with their health, but at the same time, on the back burner, maybe they're stressing themselves out because they're not focusing on building the business either. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, that's why I, I think that this whole concept of like going hard in one area is just you're setting yourself up to lose very quickly, and you're going to shortchange yourself because we all know this: that life isn't just about the one thing, right? There's there's many facets to life. And uh, the eight areas of life, which I broke down before, study it, look at it. Find ways to optimize in every area. It's totally possible. You can have it all. You've got to believe that you can have it all by showing up for yourself each and every day in those areas. When you started being an entrepreneur and you started getting success, were you surrounded by people that were encouraging you or people that were trying to put you down? Bit of both. And yeah, how, how both. did you deal with that? <clears throat> um, so... At the time when I launched Addicted to Success, one of my best friends thought it was weird. He's like, that's weird. Why would you be talking about successful people? Like, I don't get that, right? And I think maybe he was triggered. That's what it was. Maybe he was triggered that he could see that I was going a different route and he didn't want me to go that route because it meant we weren't going to be able to have the friendship or interests uh, stay the same as they, they were for so long. And it's funny, I remember my cousin at the time laughed when I put on my Facebook CEO of Addicted to Success, like, ha ha ha, CEO, like laughing about the title. And I used it as a motivation. I was like, you know what? I'm going to show you. <laughs> I'm going to show you what I can do. And now I'm not even the CEO. My, uh, my guy that works for me is the CEO and he's great at what he does. And, you know, I'll stick with founder. It's a title. That's all it really is. But I just remember like having to start going through that shifts and going, hey, like I'm actually an entrepreneur. I'm self-employed and then I moved to business owner and an investor and started investing in things. I was like, wow, this is shifting. And <clears throat> my circle naturally started changing because the conversations became different. We just value different things. And I remember six years in, just really crushing it with Addicted to Success, had online programs out, speaking at events, Uh, I was publishing ads online, doing really well with that, and doing a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching. And I remember going back to Perth, Western Australia, where I'm originally from, and hanging out with a bunch of my friends that I used to hang out with after work on a Friday night. And, and they were all sitting around in this, this place, this bar that we used to hang out at. And they were going on about you know, this person they work with, and they're a pain in the ass, and this and this and that. And I just said to them, I'm like, man, this is like deja vu. And they're like, what do you mean? I said, I remember sitting here six years ago, you guys were complaining about the same people and the same things. I said, you got three options. You either get a pay rise, move up the ladder. Second one is leave your job and find another job somewhere else for another company if you're not happy. Or third one is start your own business. But please stop whining and complaining. Okay. You know, and I got up and I paid for all of their, their food and their drinks. <clears throat> and... It shows you, like, I did that not to rub it in. I did that because I had the freedom to be able to do that, knowing that, you know, I, I was able to gift my friends this because I had put in the hard work. And two of them came to me and they said, I want to learn how to live in my vision too. Can you teach me? You know, so I was called a pussy because I wouldn't go out and club with them or drinking and all that other stuff back in the day. But I just remember thinking to myself, like, no one's seen the vision like you, Joel. You know, it's your own unique vision that you have too. It's, it's really important here because you are talking again about the vision. So do you think it's about the vision that kept you going and that people that were not supporting you, they're like, okay, I don't care. It's my vision. I want, I want my vision to be realized. And do you think that's what kept you going? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I saw the vision. I practiced it in my mind so many times. I rehearsed it over and over to the point where I believed it was already true. And... The second part of the whole vision piece is the fact that you need to transform your identity in order to be able to meet that ultimate version of you 10 years from now, today, right? Your identity doesn't just like 
you don't stay the same all the way up until the ninth year and the 351st day and then on that 352nd day, boom, or 365 days, right, boom, okay, cool, here we are. This is my new identity, it doesn't work like that. You've gotta transform your identity and the question is, do you wanna transform it in two years, five years, seven years, 10 years, or do you wanna transform it now? So what would be the advice that you would give an, uh, a young entrepreneur that wants to start, he has this amazing vision, but maybe his family is not supporting, his friends is not supporting, and he's a little bit afraid of really going for what he wants because his people around him yeah. will tell him that he's stupid, that he's, uh, he's crazy, that he shouldn't do that, but he has that vision. Like, what would be the advice that you, you would give that person? Yeah, well, if it's possible for you, and where you are depends on where you are in the world and what your situation is, your physical environment is like, move yourself to a place where you're surrounded by bigger vision talk as often as possible, right? Go and get mentorship from people that have crushed it before. Go and work for a company where CEOs or founders or managers that have done really well in leadership, that have seen their visions turn to life, that are visionaries as well, are looking for an assistant or someone to work with, right? Like you can gain so much experience from that. The fact that you're around and you're hearing high level conversations and conversations of creation, even being part of masterminds where people are creating things, that in itself shows you and creates reference points in your mind that you have now the belief that you can lean upon, not just your own, but on the others that have implemented as well, because they were where you were years ago, right? And they've created something themselves. And that's what I would say, like, you know, self-development books, podcasts, video interviews like this, um, online programs, masterminds, events, they're, all, they're great because people are in a constant conversation of creation and that's what we need is to talk about creation. You're either in destruction, stagnation or creation at any point in time. When you're a visionary, you're a weapon of mass creation, right? And that's what I really focus on with my students is just keeping them in that creation conversation along with action, game over. You just take yourself to your dreams, to a place that you you never thought existed, you know, two years, five years ago, and now you get to create it, and it's just like the back of your hand. Great, amazing. Yeah, it's fun. How did you deal with the limiting beliefs that you had when you started creating Addicted to Success? Because maybe in your head you were like, oh, I'm not good enough, or maybe that can work. Like, did it happen to you? Like, did you have self-doubt and limiting beliefs? Yeah, for sure, yeah. Yeah, I'm not a robot, I'm not perfect, I'm not on any kind of pedestal. Um, there were times that I needed to look at what other people were doing in the sense of looking for inspiration and seeing what is the greatness that lies within them, where is that in me? And not pedestaling people. That was like one of the big lessons I learned earlier on, was seeing my mentors. You know, I had some great mentors where they showed the authentic side of them as often as possible. <clears throat> <clears throat> and I got to see like, okay, this is how this person really shows up when the cameras are off, when the curtains are drawn, you know, like th this is who they are. They actually really show up like this. And I got to learn very quickly that no one's perfect, you know, so I owned it. I owned my dark, I owned my light. I owned the fact that I didn't know certain things at certain times. You know, I owned the fact that it was on me too to take responsibility to learn what I needed to learn in order to achieve success. and. Ownership and responsibility is gonna be a huge thing for any entrepreneur. When you step into the game, get ready to take risks. And how can you be ready to take risks and be more like a risk taker and ready to own your life and become responsible of yeah. your life? How, how can you do that? Cast a vision that shadows your fears and commit to that vision. Because the more you commit to that vision, the stronger your belief that you're creating something that actually has meaning and is worthwhile to the point where, yeah, your fears will come up, you know, and my fears showed up often, but my vision shattered it. I was more excited about my vision because pain can be two and a half times more powerful than pleasure, right? And on average, most people are kind of waiting for something like the external, right? Something to feel good or to sound good or to look good, to pull them a little bit closer to pleasure, to be away from the pain for a bit, which is, like I said before, it can be the distraction, social media, drinking alcohol, sex. Like I'm not saying any of that's bad. I think it's, it's fine. It's just, it just depends on like, are you masking your problems or are you facing them? 
right? And so if your vision is greater and more powerful, then it will pull you away from that. It's naturally when I started to really commit to my vision, I didn't want to go out drinking, you know, because I know I didn't want to slow myself down. I wanted to keep moving. I wanted to be high energy, high levels to create what I needed to create. Awesome. So you had to take care of your energy level so that you could really be on top of your game. Yeah. What are the things that you did that really changed your energy level? You, uh, you ate better? Like, what, what did you do? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I paid attention to what I put in my body. You know, when we eat, we eat on average three to four times a day, you know. So if that's the thing that's really going into your body and obviously out of your body, you're taking some things from that that's fueling your, your mind, body and soul. And so paying attention to that is a great place to start. Second thing is just really staying aligned and in my truth and in my values, you know, making sure that there were days where I wasn't always in my values because I was working for somebody else when I started out. If you're watching this right now, you, you do have some limitations to begin with, but you get to work your way out of those limitations. I just started becoming mindful, meditating more, visualizing more, uh, re revisiting my vision, talking with people that are more like-minded that were creating too. And it just kept my, my mind calibrated, recalibrated back and in alignment to making sure that I'm living in spirit where I'm most energetic. Naturally, people that weren't meant to be in my life fell to the wayside. They just naturally did because they could see the energy of who I was. They're like, okay, I can't mess with that guy's energy. He's not gonna accept me coming in and talking negative for two hours straight. Yep. He's got a mission that he's on. And that's what you want is people to feel like, wow, like you're a shaker and mover. You're a visionary in action. That's the key. Great, amazing. When you started um, uh, addicted to success and you start getting the success you wanted, you got offers to buy your website. Am I right? Oh yeah, yep. What what happened? Um, yeah, this was a couple years in, back in 2012, 2012, 2013, and first offer was like one million dollars. Had a look into it. I was like, ah, I don't know about this. You know, it, um. It meant that the website was going to be bought. It was going to be a non-exclusive compete. Uh, sorry, non-compete exclusive agreement, which meant that I couldn't create another website for another six years minimum. And I loved ad creating Addicted to Success. I just loved the content creation and everything. So I was like, no, nah, I'm not going to sell. And then six months later, uh, I was offered 1.2 million. And <clears throat> the guy wanted to come in and collaborate with me and put a whole bunch of programs on the site you know, like, uh, like uh, infomercial programs. Uh, yeah, just things that I didn't align with or agree with. And that deal just never happened because I was not in alignment with it. And then the third time, another guy wanted to come in for another one point, I think it was 1.2 or 1 million. And I, by that point, I was just like, I had to get really real because all these people kept coming to me and I, I hadn't been decisive enough. I was just kind of like open to the idea of maybe selling. But then I realized it would have been just money driven. What would I do? I'd, I'd get the million in Australia after taxes would be like 700 to 600,000. And then what do I do? Buy a house with that and then not create anything like that, you know, that I valued and then feel maybe, uh, maybe unfulfilled or go and create something else. And I can go and create something else, but I just was feeling like, man, I'm only just getting started. The things I wrote out in my vision was to speak on stages with people like Jack Canfield and Grant Cardone and Gary Vaynerchuk and to, you know, be involved in documentary films. All these things happened because I didn't sell my website because I committed to the vision. Even when the shiny objects came along, even when the temptation came into play. And don't get me wrong, I had a tug of war going on in my mind like this. Like, should I sell? Or should I not? Like, it kept me One up One million nights. dollars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as a 22, uh, 24 year old kid, that's a lot of money, a 24 year old millionaire, you know, that's good money. It's, it's a great success story in the media. But I realized very quickly that once I turned down multiple million dollar offers, that became an even more powerful story because people were like, wait, why did he turn it down? Yeah. You know, and um, that became very inspiring and I got a lot of press and coverage for it. And uh, it's just part of the journey, man. It's a piece of the puzzle. You and know? did you tell people that uh, for example, people who are really close to you, like your family, your friends, 
did you go and like you had a drink with them and you said, hey, I just turned down one million dollars today. <laughs> did you say that or you just said, okay, I don't want to say that. It's my decision. It's my vision. What happened? Um, yeah, I, I think the first couple of times when I did share it, that it was coming, you know, the first time it happened, I was like, wow, this is crazy. The second time, like, okay, this is interesting. This is starting to come in more and more. I guess the word was getting out that I was offered it and other people wanted to try and outbid. And I remember sharing that with my family and they were like, oh my gosh, a million dollars, right? Like it was almost like if I wasn't careful, other people could have affected and influenced my decision. But I just knew that my vision, the way I was projecting it out was just, it was so much bigger than that million, you know? And I'm so happy I never sold it. I've made way more than that. You know, in the sense that I've been able to have a, a way bigger and stronger powerful network. I've had incredible experiences. I love my career of speaking and coaching. I have so many amazing people in my space, so many amazing friends. You know, the money comes and goes, but time you never get back again. And I've really been able to live a, a life of high value in the time that I have. I believe time is a calibration of change. And there's been a lot of change in my life in a positive way and a lot of transformation and shifts because I didn't sell when I committed to my vision. And if you're watching this, you get to do that too. That's amazing. Yeah. Many people who are watching, they have problems with money. They think that maybe money can be bad or they have limitations around money. How can you help them? Like, what can you tell them that they can really go for it? Because money is not bad. It's, it's amazing, you, you can donate, you can help children, you can do amazing things. Like, yeah. how can you help them understand that they don't have to be afraid of going for a lot of money? Yeah, I, I would always just challenge that to say, do you know for sure that every single person out there that has a lot of wealth, that they're bad people? Some people are, and some people are, are great. Exactly, so we, li we live in a world where it's like, you know, black and, black and white and gray and, uh, you know, we live in a world where either or could be the situation of like that person could have a million dollars and abuse their power, uh, uh, monetary power to do bad things. And the other one could have a million and give it away and contribute, you know, and change lives. It's just, it depends on what you do with it. Remember we said before, like you got to work out why you make your money. Yeah. I think, I think even if somebody's doing it for selfish reasons, as in making money just to pay for their own stuff. Ultimately, that person can go on and go through life and still just do all that, but will they live a fulfilled life by the end of it? Probably not. They're probably living in about 50% of their potential of how fulfilled they could live. I remember the times in my life where I felt most fulfilled, it didn't really have much to do with money at all. You know, I was in Laos in Southeast Asia and we raised money to build a school for Pencils of Promise. And I just remember the look on all these little kids' faces when they come running in with their little backpacks, starting for the first day in school, the school that we built. And they, they brought the soccer ball out and they wanted to kick the soccer ball around. They were just so excited to, to, and like I was on top of a mountain in this village where we built this. It was like the nicest thing out of the whole village was the school. And even the, the adults wanted to come and sleep under the shade, you know, <laughs> on the, the school veranda. and. It was like this huge thing for them and just to see how that just like that changed their life. I was like, wow, this is amazing. Now they get to be educated, you know, because it starts with education and they wouldn't have had that before. And, you know, I look at that and just go like, wow, that wasn't all my money. I asked my community if they wanted to be a part of this with me. You know, they jumped in and, and however much people could put in, I shot like three videos like this on an iPhone posted and we raised over $52,000 to build the school. And Congratulations. Yeah, I mean, I didn't do it by myself. I did it with the Addicted to Success movement and tribe. And that just shows you, like, I didn't have to go out and do dodgy things or evil things to get that money. I just asked people, hey, do you want to be a part of this awesome feeling that we're about to experience of giving back? And at the same time, it's going to change their life too, you know? So, yeah, money's a tool. You know, it's, it's, it's energy, it's just energy. And we're currency conductors. We conduct it like this and we tell it where to go. You know, we, we orchestrate what's happening in our life through our vision and we conduct the currency and move it to where it needs to be. That's simply how it works. And do you believe that people who are like good people, 
when they got that money, they can amplify that goodness. And yeah. people who are like, they don't have great intentions and then you give them money and then it becomes a problem. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean, it's a tool, you know, it's a and tool. And then you can do whatever you want with that. Yeah, you just utilize it, you know, in that, in that way. It's like, um, you know, you can go too far with money too. It's like a, a stove, you can use it to heat things up to make your meal better or you can totally burn it, you know, and roast it out. And it's like, what, what decisions are you gonna make? Too much of anything in the material, like, which is a very hedonistic view. And I think it's funny because sometimes with addicted to success, people think like, oh, that's what it is. But I often say, no, you need to define what success is. And you can chase the money like I did initially, but you find that you end up feeling like something's missing. True success, I believe, and this is my philosophy, you've got to define it for yourself, but my philosophy is to live in my potential as often as possible. That's true success. My greatest fear is to not live in my potential enough. Yeah. You know, like there's a, I know what happens when I step into my potential, amazing things happen. Yeah. When I don't, not much happens, man. Not yeah. much that I'm proud of. <laughs> <laughs> When we met downstairs, what was really amazing, like you had that incredible energy. Like you were alive, like you entered in, in like you entered and like, oh my God, Joel is, is here. You know what I mean? You had this energy here. How do you keep this energy and how, how, how do you take care of this energy that it takes uh, amazing? Like were you like feeling really bad in, before going in and then you put yourself into state or are you like always like that? No, today, today it wasn't that. No, today it was like, I'm excited to do this. Let's jam out, man. I, I love the fact that you flew from Switzerland to be here. It's insane. Yeah. I love it. It's, that's commitment. And the other thing too is like, my mind thinks in a way now more than ever that I'm a part of something greater than myself. And I'm excited to do the work. I'm excited to go to events and speak at events. I'm excited to do podcast interviews. I'm excited to create new content because I know that it means that it's, a, it's a, an important thing. I feel like I've really tapped into my gifts and I get to express and I get to fully be me and, and it's take it or leave it. You know, some people might not understand it, but I just like, I love my life a lot. You know, I'm around amazing people. I'm in my purpose. It's doing great things in this world. Maybe some people might not agree because they have different, you know, opinions of what is contribution. But for me, it's like, man, it's, this is the most alive I've ever felt. And I get to share that as inspiration. You just never know who's watching, yeah. you know? Like when I came in and that had that effect on you when you said, it's like, oh, wow, awesome. What I hope is that you also embody that in your own unique way and show up for people in that way too and show up for just, just for you too, you know, in this world. It's so powerful. People see that, they're like, damn, that's, that's what's possible. That's you flexing your potential. What I really liked is that you said it's not about yourself, it's about the vision. So people who are afraid or people who are like a little bit stressed, instead of focusing on their own performance or the, or the things that they can do, they could just focus on pe the people they, they will help. The vision, if you focus on the vision, you're not afraid anymore. Yeah, well, I mean, to some degree, I love the vision process because what happens is 95% of our thoughts are the same as the day before, right? We only usually think 5% new thoughts, which means that we're not really living that much of intention in our life, which is why a lot of people slowly achieve their goals over a small space of time. When they have a vision, they're like, wow, they skyrocket because they start living with intention. So if your intention doubles, then your income doubles, your network doubles, your experience double, your impact doubles, right? Yep. You go from 5% to 10%, it's a huge jump. Now, what can happen is some people can get so focused on the future with their vision to the point where they're not being present with what's here. And gratitude brings you back into the present. Being grateful for the things that you have now. Being aware, like one of the practices that we, we do um, and we talk about this at our events. Emil Steenveld is really great at mindfulness. He's an emotional, uh, emotional intelligence coach. And he challenged uh, everyone at this event that we're at to when they have a shower tonight, and if you're watching it right now, when you have a shower next, 
really pay attention. Like close, close your eyes and feel the water running on your skin. Feel the temperature, right? Feel your fears, feel the sadness, feel the, the, the uh, anger, the hurt washing off you, right? Open your eyes, look at the beads of water bouncing off your skin and running down your skin. Look at how incredible that, that water is. It's clear, it's see-through. It's you know, running from a tap. Like notice it pooling around you and going down the drain, right? Listen to the sounds of the water. This is mindfulness. And when you do this, if you've never done it before, it'll blow your mind. It's just like, wow, I'm in this every day and I don't even notice these things. The science within nature, the science within you know, the, the space that I'm in, the energy that's in the material that's around me. Like, to have that mindfulness, it brings you back to a space where you now are able to make more of a clear decision. So I would say yes, the future, in order to be able to look at what can I create and what you can create is far greater than what you've already achieved, but also at the same time having the gratitude for what you have and noticing what's there and being present with it and then looking at the past as lessons that, and resources that you get to glean from, that you get to learn from. And that's what Jordan Belfort taught me. I didn't feel like I was worthy when I was younger. I was a, you know, a little party boy. I got into drugs and alcohol and you know, like other things too. And I realized like, oh, if I did these things then I can't be you know, inspiring or a positive person. That's what the story I was telling myself, the BS story, the bullshit story. When I was 20, 21, 22 years old, casting this 10 year vision and Jordan said, the greatest thing that he discovered within himself is that he is not his past. He's the lessons and resources that he's gleaned from it. And when I heard that, I was like, okay, I got to write my own permission slip. I'm not, I can't wait for anyone to write it for me and say, okay, Joel, you're fine now. You get to do this. You got to do that yourself. And how do you become more mindful? Like, do you meditate every day? Do you have a journal and every day you write down yeah. The, the amazing things that happen. Like, could you share a little bit about the things that you do to be more mindful, actually? Yeah, I'd like to say that I do it every single day, but the truth is I would do it maybe four to five times a week. Four to five, you know? And uh, I know that I feel even more in alignment when I do it seven days a week, right? So it's really about practicing it as a habit. Uh, sometimes, you know, I get up and I, I rush off because I got like a full day, but I do notice in those days, I'm like, wow, I'm not as present as I usually am or I'm not as mindful about my uh, creation or my thoughts or how I'm connecting with others. I'm not as present and it's because I haven't practiced it in the morning. And I think it's a great thing to do first thing in the morning. Meditate, visualize, journal, you know, just let yourself free flow because if you can get all the clutter and everything off the top, you then create a clear space in your mind to be able to then create new things. So new what do you do? You just write down what's in your mind or, or I do just you ask yourself questions? Yeah, well, some days I'll set intentions. I'll write down like what I'm intending to create. Um, and then sometimes I'm like, if I'm th my mind keeps circling around certain things, maybe like a decision I need to make in my business. Maybe it's somebody that I, I feel like I need to go and close out a conversation with because it's, it's still a, an open loop in my mind. Uh, that occupies 5% or 10% of my, you know, thoughts that are only 5 to 10% anyway. It's like, okay, we're not really giving ourselves much of a chance to progress if we're holding on to things from the past that are still open-ended, you know? So I'm really big on closing loops and writing out that, getting clear, writing down my emotions sometimes to, to get more connected to myself. I never used to do that. I used to think it was like, you know, yeah. girly, right? <laughs> do your diary, you know? But no, it's not that. It's just really spilling out everything that's up here that hasn't processed yet. And it's actually really important to do it before you go to bed because your brain while you're sleeping goes through this thing. It's like a, it's kind of defragging your mind and then choosing what to put into your memory and so on. It's like a computer, it's insane. And if you sit down and you write out the things, do like a brain dump before you go to sleep, you actually have a deeper REM sleep during the night because you've done a lot of the processing work real quick before you go to sleep. So now your brain doesn't have to do it as much and it gets to go into a deeper sleep. It gets that deeper REM sleep faster. Like that's insane. That's an awesome hack. Implement it. <laughs> yeah. When you started Addicted to Success, were you working? Like did, did you have a job? I was working a nine to five. I was okay. in sales. Yeah. And, I, and how, did you, how did you manage 
addicted to success and the nine to five? Because I know that many people who right. are watching that, they don't know, like, should I quit my nine to five? Or how, like, right. how, how can I then manage? Yeah, the way I managed it was um, I committed for two years straight to just go all in and it, it took a lot of energy, a lot of focus. And <clears throat> I was working an eight hour day and then I would spend two hours in traffic. It was like one hour to work, one hour uh, back home. That was two hours a day, 10 hours a, a week, 40 hours a month, 400 and something hours a year that I was wasting my life sitting in traffic. And so I spent that time to come up with concepts to record myself speaking on topics. And then when I get home, I type up the articles. And sometimes I would squeeze it in a little bit when I was at the office desk at work to update content on the website. And I just knew that I had these goals and I knew that there was something that had to shift, that I had to make new commitments that I hadn't made before. And I was willing to do that. And I saw the rewards come in because I committed to my vision. What makes a great leader? Because you seem to be an amazing leader. Like when you walk, like you own the place, like you, you lead people. Yeah. What is a great advice that you, that you could give people that they can immediately implement in themselves yeah. to be a, a more leader. effective leader? Yeah, a great leader trusts themselves. And how can I trust myself? How can they trust themselves? By being a man or a woman of your word and know that that doesn't happen overnight. The more that I've committed to my goals and my vision, the more that when I feel something and it doesn't feel right, if it's like, let's say, in a relationship with someone or a partnership or in business or you know, someone in the family or whatever it may be, if it doesn't feel right, to go and communicate that in a compassionate way, to be able to resolve it. A leader knows how to resolve issues for themselves and for others to be able to support in resolving. And that's what I've been practicing for so many years. You know, it's like, oh, if this thing keeps circling like a shark, ready to eat its prey in my mind all the time and keeping me in that space of stress, I need to acknowledge the fact that that's there instead of avoiding it, hiding from it, pretending not to know that it's there and facing it. A leader's courageous in facing what needs to be faced and shows up for it every time. That is true leadership. Awesome. Yeah. Do, you, do you have a last message for success? Oh, last message would be, and this is a question, If you knew that what you really wanted had a price tag on it and you knew that there was a way to be able to pay the price and you knew what that cost was, will you be willing to pay the price to make it reality? And I think that a lot of people really want things, like they say, I want these things, but they don't really, really, really want it. They're not willing to show up every day to change their habits, to learn and humble themselves to be the student again and to invest and to be patient. Patience really is a, a secret sauce that so many people aren't willing to taste. <laughs> you know, they're just, they're waiting for uh, the results before deserving the results. And I think that that in itself, when you think about it, like how can we be entitled to, to get that thing that we want if we haven't put the work in? And I think a lot of people would just have this like short sightedness, what it takes to be able to get the thing because they haven't started to do the work to realize what kind of work is required in order to be able to create it. There was a hell of a lot more work it started to come into play when I committed to my vision, but I was like, you know what, I've already started. Yeah. I didn't know all this other work was gonna be here, but now I can have more of a realistic understanding of what's required now because I've got the ball rolling before I didn't. Yeah. So yeah, get ready to take the action, get ready to take risks. Uh, know that everything is a practice. Abundance is a practice, scarcity is a practice. Most people are practicing scarcity all the time, you know? <laughs> So just really placing bets on yourself and not hiding from the things that are holding you back, facing them and, and being prepared to take risks and jump in because that's really where all the juice 